Hi, I'm Phil Anderson and welcome to my channel. I've been a property investor now for over 30 years and I've watched investors continue to make the same common investment mistakes. There's so many dirty tricks in the real estate industry and it's all caught up in a whole heap of sales hype. I want to cut through that sales hype and help investors avoid the common mistakes. I hope you enjoy the following content, but please remember to like and subscribe. G'day listeners and viewers across the country and welcome to another episode of Street Smart Property Investing where, as always, we'll have a look behind the headlines, see what's going on on the street in Australia's property markets. Now over recent weeks we've been talking about the process of buying. We decided to map out a five-step process and during those five steps I've been joined by a couple of Australia's, you know, kind of uh, specialists in the field of property investing, one from the perspective of, you know, the uh, property strategy, the buyer's, um, you know, kind of strategy towards buying the right property, Mr Gordon Ruddy. Morning, Phil. How are you, pal? Great. That's the way, mate. He's one of the most known and trusted property investors in Australia, so you bring a lot of value having you here on the panel, mate. I appreciate you being here again. And Mr Mr Trent Durrington. Uh, affectionately known as the Bulldog, the guy that goes into battle on behalf of investors negotiating, you know, great uh, property opportunities in many of the hottest markets. And it's damn tough at the moment, mate. Yeah, good to be here, mate. Good, Gorda. Um, yeah, it is tough. Tough work for me. Mate, Working I'm glad five to see. Times harder. Mate, I'm glad to see, you know <laughs> but, what I mean? Um, securing some unbelievable properties and um, seeing clients make equity before even going home. It's crazy, right? It's crazy. So, so, you know, I get excited for our, for our clients. Mate, I've never seen a market like it. Like you said, quite honestly, I'm seeing you put together packages and you're looking at it through your normal, you know, kind of, you know, uh, hyper-vigilant, fine-tooth comb process, looking at every detail. And then two streets away, we're seeing properties that are selling the same size, the same block size, et cetera, et cetera, for 100, 200 grand more. Um, mate, so it's pretty exciting. If you can get the damn block of land, you can get that process together, which is not easy. Yeah, it's a, well, we always feel like it's a, a bespoke model in us securing the right property for, um, and, you know, fitting the right strategy for Gordy and our clients. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's all different price points. Uh, there's all exciting different areas and stories and growth. And, um, you know, there's a bum for every seat, so to speak, meaning that would, uh, depending on budgets and strategies, um, you know, securing the right property, although it's tough, um, you know, it's a lot of benefits for the, for the clients. Yeah, mate, it, we're proving it can be done, right? We, we, we had some concerns. Like a couple of months ago, we were like, holy dooly, this is... This is different, right? You know what I mean? Um, the, the areas we want to be in and, and if you're an investor, you, you know, it, you're sort of locked out of, you know, those markets, those, you know, those specialty kind of estates and, and real hotspots in the market. It, it's almost impossible to get into. Um, and we had concerns, but of course, largely through your relationships and long-term, you know, associations, uh, as, you know, with, with big builders, big land developers, we've been able to work out a model that's proving to be, you know, uh, highly productive for an investor. Um, but, mate, I just – I can't imagine how people are doing it on their own at the moment. I really can't. Uh, well, I don't – I think they would – if they chose to do it on their own, they might get a tenth of the way through the process and go, no. Too hard. Yeah. Uh, or they end up in a market that they can do it, but it's not really a hot spot. Mm, it's just mm. a market that's got, you know, it's, it's got land available and you can do it and it might still work out okay. And, and, and like most property, over 15 or 20 years, it most likely will work out more than mm. <laughs> okay. Um, but the be best markets, the ones that are set for that sort of growth and where we're seeing this really rapid, uh, you know, equity gain, um, mate, it's tough. It's yeah, tough. Mm, yeah. Boys, back from the start, uh, just a recap for the listeners. Of course, in, in the last four episodes, we talked about, you know, uh, the buying process. We started with understanding your why, having a good strategy plan, having the, you know, a real defined approach to make sure you're going to be, you know, targeting the goals and the, you know, get the outcomes that you're looking for, treating property as a vehicle to create wealth and making sure you know what sort of uh, strategy suits your time, your budget, et cetera, et cetera. So step number one was really about getting clear, right? Getting clear on what you're going after. Number two was about, well, where are we going to focus? What location are we going to step into? What would be the best markets? How do we pick hotspots? Uh, we've been focused on the sweet spot in the Australian property market for some time now. Probably uh, for me, it's been, 
you know, a 30-year passion to pick a level of market that has consistent growth but offers really good, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, rental yields, a whole range of things that come together, and I think it's a sweet spot. And today those markets are the hottest markets, so we've got 30 years' experience mm. that we're drawing on at the moment, and that's a real big advantage. But once you've found that market, that postcode to invest in, we then discussed in, in you know, step three of that process, how do we narrow down that market to find the right property type in that market? How do we define the best, you know, area of the market, the best floor plan, property type, what's going to give us the best rental demand, the best rental yield, the best experience as a landlord? That was number three. Number four, we found it. We've narrowed it down. We've got it all put together. How do we control the contract? How do we pay the right price? How do we make sure it doesn't spiral out of control by the price changing? The you know the the builder changing, you know, moving the goalposts. You know, um, how do we make sure we're protected if you know construction takes longer than expected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. That was the first four steps in the process and now you're at a point where you've got the keys to that property and I believe step number five is vital because a lot of people get the keys, we're all busy and we just don't cross the finish line and finish the race and just tick those last few boxes and have you know a great landlord experience. I want to touch on that for the listeners. This is all about you know uh, having a great landlord experience. I've been known for many years. I've been happy to call myself a lazy investor. Uh, I've had a crack at a lot of things, and I've got a lot of different things in my portfolio. But you know I've learned the best thing for me is to let the property do the work. Uh, and a big part of me being able to be a lazy investor is having a great property management team right i might just start with gordy because this is probably you know right in his wheelhouse um gordo as they call you mate i've noticed <laughs> that you know i'm i'm old school we've known each other you know 30 plus years and and you're gordy to me but everywhere i go people call you gordo you know it gordo. must be that you know the the 2020 um i'm a bit you know i'm getting a bit long in the tooth so gordo <laughs> tell us what the um you know, that, that whole thing about a property management team, mm-hmm. just describe to the listeners the importance of that relationship. Well, I think it's the, it's the most important, I think. Once, you, once you've got the property, once we've done all those, you know, the first four steps that we've spoken about in the, in the you know, in the last four podcasts, get yourself the right property manager and it can take just so much time, stress, worry out of that experience. I know for me with my property managers, I get them to manage it. You know, they they pay the rates for me. You know, they pay all the. You know, when you sign up, you'll you'll give them authority to to spend you know up to a certain limit just to make sure they don't need to be bothering every minute if it's a little thing that you know that needs to be looked after. Sure. You know, you get them to you, know, you give them some leeway to make decisions on things, and they'll send you you know receipts for what need to be done. And then you know, at the end of the month, it's just a. You know, it's basically a, oh, I'll open it up, I have a look at that, beautiful, that's how much went in the bank account, and flick that on, your, you know, to your bookkeeper or, the, or your accountant. So it's really, really important. Give them respect too. If they do give you a call, you know, pick that up, you know, talk to them. Um, you know, what you want them to do for you is, you know, ensure that, um, you know, those leases are getting renewed, whether it's a six-month or a 12-month lease. Don't let... You know, your tenants run on to what they call a continuance. You know, you want them signed to a lease at all times. Uh, I think that's important there, Gordy. There's about ten important things mm. there. The the thing is, the the reason why you would keep your tenant on a lease is because you and I have both, you know, had property investments now for a very long time. And we've seen what can happen if you let a tenant go month by month and you might be a great tenant and people make the mistake of treating a regular, you know, a, a tenant that pays rent on time as, you know, you know, treats the house with respect, et cetera, et cetera. You can tend to treat them differently and the problem with that is, and they're, they're highly valued, but what happens is over time if you don't put them back on a lease and you're not just adjusting the rent even if it's only five or ten bucks, you know, if you're not adjusting the rent, you you fast forward five years and that tenant can feel like he owns the property. Mm. And then things be get, 
it can get quite awkward. You know, we've seen that situation. We've got to be careful that we make sure they realise they're a, a tenant, this is a business, this is, you know, this is a process we need to make sure we, you know, they understand, you know, the important role it, and yeah. the respect, of, you know, of each other's roles. Mm. Mate, the whole thing about a, idea about a property manager and one thing that um, also comes to mind is we start that process very early. Before we're going into a market and, and uh, determining what to buy, we've already interviewed property managers. You and I have been in many areas, interviewed a number of property investors, uh, sorry, property managers, to get a gut feel as to who is really passionate, who connects with that role, who sees that role as a professional service. It's not just the back office mm-hmm. of a real estate agent. You know, it's, it's a professional service. They have uh, a real knack, that people skill, but that strong... Uh, you know, confident role where they can, you know, uh, play a very respectful but a very confident and assertive role in that property management space. And as we've found those right people and they've given us advice on what would be the most rentable property, the right floor plan, what's going to attract the uh, attract the right quality tenants, um, uh, we kind of then have empowered ourselves that once we produce that property, exactly what they said would be the most rentable and get us the best quality uh, experience, they now uh, have been gifted the opportunity to prove themselves right. Mm. So I think that's a really powerful thing because we follow that advice, we deliver that product, When they know that product's about to be delivered, they're in there early, quite often a month before you even get the keys. They're already in there helping you have another set of eyes and Mm -hmm. and we've seen uh, people in that role be a great uh, third party to come in and just check the grout and all of those little details to do that full, you know, incoming tenant uh, inspection. But it's another set of eyes over the property Mm. quite often. And then they've got the tenants organised to move in as soon as you get the keys. So the property managers, I think sometimes when they do those inspections, uh, invaluable, even more so than even getting an independent building inspector to look at something, Mm -hmm. those property managers look at the real, the finer details of stuff. You know, Mm -hmm. they're not not really looking at the structural stuff. They want to, they're looking at the finish of everything. Mm -hmm. We're, We're a building inspector, he wants to make sure you know the you know the the ties are on between the you know the roof trusses and the frames and all that sort of stuff. They're really looking at the paintwork and you know looking at the bench tops and just those finer things, which all I think the cosmetic the, stuff. Yeah, right? which is which is really important. I mean, the, the structural stuff is good, but you know you want you want the you know your home to you know, the finished product to be. Yeah, Bang on. Uh, the interesting thing is when you see a property manager's report, they'll take dozens and dozens and dozens of photos, right? When the house is furnished and all of that stuff, right, they'll get in and take photos of all the different angles and give you a nice report. So when the house is empty, my gosh, mm. you know, they've got the ability to see things in every detail and, of course, that gives us one, uh, you know, you could be in another state but you get a chance to be able to see everything's perfect and if there isn't it's just been picked up on so mm. that can be done before we get handover um, but then we've also got a perfect handover process to a tenant where we're starting from day one with photographic evidence of exactly what the state of that property was so that we can maintain that level of presentation going forward so it's a it's, it is mm. a great a great service you know mate uh, over to over to Trent now Trent of course, everyone thinks of you as being the spreadsheet master. You've got a spreadsheet for everything, mate. I, I see the rows on rows of detail of what you follow um, because, you, mate, you look at everything through every stage of construction, every part of a process, every detail of contracts and, you know, every everything, right? So, you know, my hat's off to you that you are that totally analytical you know, kind of uh, spreadsheet-driven um, acquisition specialist, but that carries over to the way you're a pro- you're a, a landlord as well, mate. I know that you you have processes straight after things like making sure you're getting you know your depreciation schedule supplied back to your accountant and so forth. You want to describe some of the checklists that you follow straight away? Ah, uh, well, that that depreciation schedule is is key uh, on completion of the of the dwelling. Um, uh, you get a report which, you know, details all your uh, items that are to, can be depreciated. Uh-huh. Um, once that's received, it's given to your accountant. 
accountant then depending on what your structure is with your taxes, whether you're PAYG or self-employed, just to maximise your cash flow in, in your monthly or weekly. Let me just explain that to the listeners because a depreciation schedule probably doesn't mean a lot to most investors. But the way that I would explain it is that when you look at Australia's negative gearing laws, we've got the best you know, property acquisition laws you know, for investors in the world. And I've looked at many countries, mm. Australia gives amazing incentives to investors. They decide they don't want to supply housing in Australia. They want investors to supply the housing. And they give us great incentives, but very few investors actually take advantage of it. Most people do negative gearing in a very negative way, where it's driven by negative cash flow. What we have proven is that you can do it in an incredibly positive way and utilise negative gearing laws in the way that you know I believe they should be utilised, which is via using that depreciation schedule and what we would call paper losses. So it's the right there, the written uh, values of, of uh, fittings and fixtures and construction and so forth, and it's a bit complex, but your accountant will get this back to a list of paper deductions, not physical costs, but, you know, paper deductions, which is like having monopoly money instead of throwing real money on the on on you know uh, the average negative gearing uh, investor over the years would have put a hundred dollars of real money on the you know real loss on the on the table on the blackjack table and, and walked away 50. with yeah get back 50 maybe only get back you know or whatever the number is right but they get back something and think oh well, that's a good deal negative gearing for me I'm using a hundred dollars of monopoly money right to get back real money and that's how I see when you do it right, and you're using depreciation and you're using those paper deductions, um, it's 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 gold if an investor can do that. And the laws changed in 2019, and it's even more geared that way. If it's not brand new, you get a fraction of the benefits. You've got to be a brand new property. So a depreciation schedule gives everything that your accountant needs to make sure you're maximising that. That's what a depreciation schedule does. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A little bit better description than... I don't know if it is better. I tried <laughs> to get it out. I don't know. It felt like a bit of a riddle, yeah. but hopefully we got yeah. there. Yeah. Um, the other side of it, mate, is a... Um, uh, what I would suggest is, um, particular for PAYG wage earner, <laughs> is get a tax variation launched yeah, yeah, straight away. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, well, I, I can help explain that, I guess, is that tax variation based on the depreciation you're getting from your, your brand new dwelling goes to your employer, um, and th- which is produced by your, your accountant, your accountant mm-hmm. and instead of paying, um, you get your paycheck every week, instead of paying $1,000 worth of tax, because of this variation, you might only pay... Nine hundred dollars worth of tax. Correct. Now I'm just plucking numbers here. Sure. Um, so effectively, you get an extra hundred bucks in your pocket each week. Yeah. yeah. And 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 if the, you know the uh, without depreciation, if the, you know the uh, cash flow was I don't know a negative cash flow of twenty dollars a week because of that tax variation, you now got. $80. $80. Yeah, if we're working on that. Extra, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, Whatever. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And this is why in today's market, and it's not uncommon, go, t- talk mm. about some of the numbers you're seeing when you see this really utilised on a brand new property today. How much positive cash flow some average in average, from wage earners from are running? $80. Yeah, and yeah, when I say wage earners on probably eighty to 100000 which yep. is a good, that's a good wage. Yeah. Um, they're seeing tax um, or positive cash flow out of the properties they're purchasing somewhere between one hundred and eighty dollars a week and three hundred dollars a week, depending on the on the property and their exact circumstances. Crazy, yeah. right? You know, that's that's amazing cash. That flow. makes a huge difference to you know if they've still got their you know some mortgage left on their principal place of residence. That strategy is just amazing to go. Well, I can you know I can purchase this brand new investment property. No money out of my pocket. I've used uh-huh. the you know the equity from from my home. Purchase this new one. Take that hundred and eighty to three hundred, whatever it might be. Apply that to the principal place of residence, and save themselves you know ten, eleven, twelve years off that home mortgage. So instead of going. Oh, I finally got it paid off by 65. They yeah. got it paid off by 55. We've seen some great you know? scenarios and, on that. And because they saved that time, they've saved another $250,000 in interest they would have yeah. paid. Look, I don't think people realise what this window to build wealth really represents. The, the leverage that you can get at the moment, the cash flow you can pick up on the right investment properties, 
that cash flow situation that you can then apply against, you know, the, the, the bad debts, the personal debts to make sure you're getting rid of that at a time where you haven't got much interest to service. So you've got the extra cash flow being more effective because there's a lower amount of interest you're paying across both, you know, investment and personal debt. This is an amazing window to build mm. wealth, right? This is just crazy times. But let, let me just recap quickly for the for the uh, listeners. So we talked first about as a landlord, to make your landlord experience as pleasurable as possible, start by having the right team behind you that really is, um, you know, going to take care of 95% of everything that is to do with managing that uh, property investment, and that is that property management team. Interview them. Get them to take some ownership early. Get them to be part of the handover process. Get them to make sure that the tenants are going to be in very, very, you know, quickly once you take possession of the property. Get them to pay your rates. Get them to service, take care of all of those things. And like you said, Gordy, uh, when they send you an email, I think it's very smart to respond very, very quickly because if you show them that you respond quickly, you send a clear message to them that you want them to respond quickly mm-hmm. to everything as well. Make them, treat them like they're an employee because they kind of are. They're getting a small percentage of your rent for that service. Well, it's just like the, it's, I've said it before that an investment property is like your very own business. Mm-hmm. An investment property is a business. It's a business that you don't need to work in. Mm-hmm. Your property manager is that general manager or CEO that you've appointed to that business. Mm-hmm. So if that was a, a business outside of property, how do you treat that CEO? You're not going to ignore him. Uh-huh. You're going to treat him with respect because he's running that company for you uh-huh. and you, you want the best out of him. And, and property managers, you know, they, they're a special – a good property manager is a special, for one better term, breed of person. You well, get the right property manager – and you can tell what they are. They, they, you know, I think it's someone like Terry. She, just, she loves it. You want somebody she that does. absolutely loves what they do, mm-hmm. and we know she does. Mm. And you know, you don't want someone who's looking at being a property manager as a job, as a task. Oh, I've got, I've got to do this today. I've got to do that today. Terry loves. You know, looking after people. Yeah, her energy is amazing, and it that's is. a that's a, a key uh, property manager in one of the key regional locations that we, you know, we love and uh, have done very well out of, which is Port Macquarie. Now, um, inside of that role as well, Gordy, I guess the thing is from the perspective of um, you know by bringing that person in early, making them feel like they're helping you select the property, um, giving them the property that they said would rent the easiest, give them the best quality tenants to deal with, have no maintenance issues. You're really giving them an opportunity to shine Mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm sure that that gives them more, like I said, ownership and more involvement and more more connection to wanting to prove themselves right, that they've given you good advice. We take it one more big, big step and this is one of the advantages of, of being, you know, grouping individual investors together is someone like Terry or any of the others in any of the other locations would realise that they're not just dealing with one investor when they're dealing with our, you know, our, our model and our group of investors that follow what we do. Um, it's not just that one investor that they're looking after because we might have 70 properties across that entire market. Um, if that person has a bad experience, there's a chance that that you know, that feedback might go back to Phil or somebody else on the team and then that could be an issue because they're not really connected to one property only. There's a whole range of properties that they have the potential of losing and that would be a, a terrible it's thing. A so we get a bit of unfair advantage, I guess. Mm. Excuse, Bless you. Excuse me. Um, look, and, and then the, the other side of the coin was taking, um, you know, from the property management passing over everything you need to your accountant, making sure your accountant's well armed up with a, you know, a depreciation schedule, the tax variation is making your cash flow uh, strong from day one, making sure that you have optimised all of the benefits of that, you've taken away as much of the workload in paying rates and, you know, all of those things. You can even get the property manager to send the um, summary of your monthly summary of, uh, you know, rent paid and uh, expenses paid, all of those things, your, your summary for the month you can get your accountant copied into that uh, monthly summary which is what I do so that my accountant is basically getting uh, all of the things I'm going to need for my annual tax uh, purposes so you can really become a very lazy investor if you just have the right people around you and you just know the basics of how to set it up 
Yeah. Yeah, no, that's right, exactly. And yeah, then from right. there, the big thing is keeping an eye on it, making sure that you don't let that property fall behind in mm-hmm. rent. We've talked about this. If I go in and I buy a property, let's say it's a dual income property where I'm going to get 6%, um, you know, rental yield, um, and I, you know, want to hold that property for the longer term, not, not very often do we see markets like we're seeing at the moment where, uh, you know, prices of properties are growing and rents are growing at exactly the time, uh, same time. Typically that doesn't happen. Typically, you know, property prices will rise and rents will fall a bit behind Then prices will slow down on property but, but, but the rental yields will catch up again. But over time, uh, we've proven, Gordy, that over time you can have that same expectation that even once your property's doubled in value – there will be, um, you know, a moment in time where your rent catches up and you're getting the same rental yield that you were getting all those yep. years earlier. So don't let the properties fall behind, the rents fall behind, because some people just don't they fall, watch the, it. Pe- people fall into the trap of always thinking of what did I pay for that property, what am I getting for it today, and that's what they look at their yield. But that's yep. not that yep. the, the true yield of the property. Is what's my, I might have paid 500 for it today. In 10 years' time, if it's worth 900 that's what my, I want my yield to be based on the nine hundred. Yeah, if you're getting five percent today, you want to be getting five percent exactly. at the, at the, yeah. uh, in that other market on, as on well. the new value, not on Correct. the yeah, not on the original purchase price. And that's that's definitely an expectation. Mm. And of course, Trent, we are often seeing and, and doing it ourselves. Uh, the performance of properties, of course, we're very heavily involved in land. Land is one of the key things driving property values. That's a big passion of ours: is land and it understanding land. Yeah. Um, but you've got to watch it because, uh, you know, it's very easy for someone to have a great landlord experience, great cash flow experience, not realise how much that property's grown in value, you have a bit of a feel but not really know, you actually switch off to it because there is no pain, it's cash mm. flow positive, but you could be missing out on an opportunity to tap into that equity and duplicate, get that property portfolio growing quicker. Well, you know, we talk about property investing and, and uh, investors flooding back into the market now. At the end of the day, I think we all agree that the best time to invest is when you can afford it or when you've got the the ability to borrow the money and invest. And a lot of that time is because you've had existing properties in your portfolio have built some equity. Um, That's the time to invest. Mm. So although it's a hot market now, very well, a couple of years ago, you should have been investing. Yeah, uh, based on untapped equity that you've got that you didn't really know you had. No, and and, and I, I see the amount of people that I'm talking to. I've got people ringing me, and I'm saying, "Okay, I'll help you out." Gordy's flooded. We're all flooded. And I'm saying, "Yep, I'll talk to people. I'll have a chat to you." And as I'm working with people, I'm going, y- "You can do two or three properties here," and they're yeah. like, "Going really?" I'm going, "Absolutely," yeah. you know. And and look, in hindsight, you know, they should have been investing a couple of years ago, mate. But mate, just, um, and they would have seen even better gains than what they're going to get now but um can't go back you can't go back so uh, oh man i think there's yeah, amazing yeah, growth yeah, still yeah, to yeah. be had mm. particularly in some of those regionals where that population is yeah. spilling in land is running yeah. out oh my gosh so, I, yeah i'm excited so closing the loop on what you your question was mate yeah you've always got to be understanding what is your market doing for yeah. that particular property yeah um and if that's um putting your hand up to a strategist and, or whoever it might be you and saying, you know, maybe we need to look at um, just assess set, it. Yeah, just, just have a look, yeah, right? And it's an easy, it's an easy um, um, scenario or, or process, rather, uh, to understand what equity have you made in the last twelve months. Mm. Yeah. Hey Matt, look, I, I guess, guys, you know, I mean, this has been really helpful. I think this five-step process has helped investors get some framework, right? You know, starting by starting with your strategy, thinking about really what should I be going after. Don't just let a fear of missing out just make you jump into the market and grab anything. Understand up front what you should be doing. Talk to someone like Gordy. Get your strategy right. Know what's going to give you the result you're looking for, what's going to be the right vehicle for you to create wealth. Then look at what market we're going to apply that in, what's going to be the market that's got, you know, short and long-term growth and going to give you good rental yields. Inside of that market, how do we buy the right property? Talk to the property managers, define what's the right floor plans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Someone like Trent being able to make sure you're building with a reputable builder, you're going to get a great quality product, you're going to, you know, step that through to the contract phase in step number four and and control the contract, pay the right price, um, not have the price blow out, et cetera, et cetera. And then in step number five, get that property management team 
to do the work for you, be responsible, um, you know, make sure they're on their game, make sure they're renewing leases, maximising rent, etc. Your accountant will just need the basic stuff. He'll just want your depreciation schedules and those rental statements. He can then get the tax variation done, get that money back in your pay each week. So as an investor, you can hit the button at the start and get to the end and have a team of people that have helped you through that process and you're at the end of that process with a cash flow positive position and you've never used a cent out of your pocket. And this is a market that more investors than ever before can have that rental experience Mm. if they just respect all five of those steps. That's it. That's it. Well, hopefully that's been of help to you guys. Uh, listeners, I hope you've enjoyed that. And thanks for joining me for this five-step, uh, you know, kind of little, uh, you know, journey, guys. I appreciate, as always, having you guys uh, in here in the studio helping investors, you know, make safer and, and uh, you know, higher-performing property investment decisions. So thanks for joining me. Yeah, good pleasure. Good to be part of the team, mate. Good and on you, mate. Uh, the investors out there get part of the team. Yeah, like, and uh, obviously we're all here to help and support them. Yeah. So thanks for joining us. Good on you. Thank you. Cheers, Good guys. Trent. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to subscribe and also feel free to leave me a question. I look forward to helping as many property investors as possible. Take care and we'll talk soon.